Shawnee Cohen is my guest. He's the director of Rat Park. That just I didn't think it was out yet, Shawnee, but I saw it today on Crave, so it must be just newly out, is it? Yeah, it's been out about a week. Um, okay. I think this is the second weekend, yeah. Okay, great. So just, just for the, the listeners or people watching, tell us a little bit about who you are and, uh, and how we got to this place of Rat Park, the movie you just put up. Yeah, my name is Shawnee Cohen. I am a film director. I kind of specialize lately in documentaries. I got my start in kind of animation. But um, yeah, over the last, I think, 10 years or so, I've been kind of focusing on a lot of documentary work that has to do with um, addiction. And not all addiction that has to do with drugs, but addiction in general. So um, one of the first films I did about 10 years ago was about my family who happened on a strip club in Guelph and I just kind of showed up there and decided to film them. Um, <laughs> didn't have too much of a relationship prior to filming them, which was interesting. And what I noticed was my parents were struggling with a lot of eating disorder type stuff. My mother was anorexic. My father was like grossly overweight. And I found this really interesting that they were struggling with body issues while working in a strip club. Um, since that film came out, I found that a lot of the work that I do um, now that I work for Vice, has a lot to do with addiction and drug use. So um, I would say that five or six years ago, I was one of the first filmmakers in the world to do a feature about fentanyl. Um, and I kind of learned a lot from that experience. And Rat Park is kind of the last in a line of documentaries that really um, looks at addiction more from like a policy angle and what governments are doing and tries to get deep into like the underlying layers of the drug war and I really wanted to make a film that um, was kind of bigger and bolder than the addiction stuff I've done in the past. All right so you're obviously an artist and attracted to uh, maybe social issues more than you know the conservative right-leaning brain. Uh, what was your underlying commitment here? What, what, what did you did you have a goal in mind when you set out to do this project and if so what, what was it that you wanted to try and uh, change or affect? I think for me, I don't really go into projects with this idea that I, you know, need to change the world or come up with a concept that um, is big and bold, some political statement. It really started with this curiosity, and, and I kind of wanted to go to the worst place in the world for drug use and the drug war and the best place. And through all the research I've done, it kind of appeared that, you know, there was quite a, quite a contrast between Portugal and, and Manila. And while hanging out in these places and filming, I realized that um, the environment, how people live and how the government treats users, stigma, drug users, um, has so much to do with, you know, how we look at the drug war and look at the problems with addiction. And, you know, slowly after filming, um, you know, this idea of Rat Park came into play. And I learned a lot from Bruce Alexander, this Canadian scientist or psychologist who basically figured out that if you put you know, rats in a cage and they have nothing to do and they're isolated and all they have to do is water or heroin, they'll gravitate towards the heroin. And he kind of wanted to turn this idea on its head because in the 70s, everyone thought, oh, you do drugs, drugs must be the cause um, for everything. And he figured, you know, that's not really true. I, I want to kind of disprove this. So he called, he made something called Rat Park. So he makes this giant place for rats to live in. They have treats, they can have sex, they can raise each other's young ones. And and really, he just made them not isolated, and they were able to kind of run around, and he did the same thing, heroin and water. And it was quite a sophisticated experiment for its time, and he took, like, an obscene amount of data. And after a while, he realized that the rats in um, Rat Park that weren't isolated didn't gravitate as much to the heroin. And what he learned from this whole process was that you can't understand addiction and, unless you understand the environment you're in. And that really made a lot of sense since I was like kind of in Manila, the worst place in the world for drugs, and, and Portugal, the best place, because I realized that set and setting and the environment had so much to do with, um, you know, why people use drugs, the opiate crisis, um, people dying in the street because they use drugs. So it, it, that experiment made sense, and I kind of tied it all together and made this film called Rat Park. Yeah, so do you think the, the addiction, it sounds like you feel like it's based in hopelessness? I wouldn't say it's based in hopelessness. There's a lot of misconceptions about addiction I learned. You know, we did a lot of research, and you find out little statistics like, you know, only 10% of people who actually use drugs or abuse drugs um, 
compared to 90% who don't. So yeah, um, just let but, me stop you there, Shani. That's a great yeah. point, and that's a that's a fact. And if you can consider, I, I mean, I didn't research this. Yeah. I've never looked it up, but that's something that yeah. jumped out at me. And I, and what I heard, and maybe I heard it incorrectly, is that 10% of users are addicts. Like the yeah. and the rest, the ninety yeah. percent of uh, users are, you know, for pleasure, and they're not addicted, and it doesn't ruin their lives. I just found that right. amazing. I mean, it sounds like it. It's probably right. I mean, the the extremes yeah. are usually of the lowest percentage, but uh, yeah, that that really jumped out at me as well. Yeah, it's actually me too. Actually, when I was researching, that's actually a UN statistic, and I do a ton of research. So okay. it's not that the ninety percent um, use it recreationally, but ninety percent of people who use drugs um, wouldn't fall into what you, I guess, classify as an addict or someone who has a problem. Okay. But here's the issue. Um, the 9 or 10% who do use, who have problems, um, like almost every government in the world base every drug policy and, and focuses a drug war on that 10%. Mm. Um, and it gets complicated. And this is what's interesting about the documentary and the research. Drug policy is not sexy. Like when you watch Intervention in a lot of these shows, it just kind of shows users and people kind of form these opinions about, you know, people using drugs and, and that's that. But doing Rat Park, I realized there's like a lot of like interesting information that may not be as interesting for the normal person who doesn't know anything about addiction, but drug policy um, is super interesting. What does that mean? So if you consider that 10% um, and we make these drug laws for that 10% and you look at all these people dying of opiate overdoses, what's really interesting is a lot of the people who are dying aren't necessarily like abusing the drug. The problem is because opiates and a lot of these drugs on the street aren't regulated and they have to go to the street to get th these drugs, um, they're doing fentanyl and they're dying. And they're, these aren't necessarily people who are like classically addicted. So you learn a lot about drug supply and why drugs are illegal and not illegal. And that's what I found really, really interesting. Shawnee Cohen is the director of Rap Park. What else surprised you about it? Wait, you know, uh, Shawnee, what's something else that jumped out at me? Uh, oh, I think I took his name down. It was one of the, or, well, he's featured throughout the movie. Uh, maybe it was the addict in uh, Manila. You're never yeah. addicted to one drug. You're addicted to altered states. I found, like, yeah. wow. I, I, like, we know that. But it just sounded so profound coming from, a, like, a yeah. regular daily user. Yeah, so that guy was in Portugal, and what was interesting oh. about Tiago was, yeah, yeah, so he's so okay. a guy who's been using crack and heroin every day, and he he has problems. I'm not going to say that his life is perfect, but um, he just kind of wants to be left alone to be an artist, work in the studio. <laughs> he's a very celebrated pottery artist in the country, and, and he's well known for using drugs and doing his thing, but it was interesting because when I filmed him, you know, there was quite a nuance between someone who small nuance between someone who would like drink wine in their studio and work on pottery or right mm. and someone that was using crack and i mean they're completely different drugs and i'm not comparing them but it got me on this idea that you know let's look at how many people die from alcohol related deaths and it far outweighs um <laughs> like opiates and all other drugs which i found really interesting but mm. um because he's using drugs like he's literally considered a user and he has problems and people kind of hate him but you know I think the idea that if we compare in that same context to alcohol, um, you kind of learn a lot between why one is legal, the history of why one became legal, and the other one didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, you touched on Bruce Alexander. I'd like you to expand on him a little bit more, but specifically yeah. this idea of an alternative uh, reinforcer, an attractive yeah. alternative to, let's say, crack. And I, I love uh, Diego's... Uh, you know, his, how he said, oh, I started when I was, uh, I don't know, 16 or something like that. And it was yeah. hash. And then 17 was LSD. And then I snorted some Coke. And then I did some meth. And then I smoked some crack. And then he said, and right. everything changed since I smoked the crack. It sounded like, yeah. you know, it, you've got drugs. And he even said, you have to learn to be a heroin addict. But uh, again, just going back to this uh, this idea of an, an attractive alternative or how Bruce Alexander, I think, called it an alternative reinforcer. And in this case, yeah. they used money or crack. And most reasonable people, according to your movie, says that most of the time, uh, reasonable people choose the money. It's a, That surprised yeah, me as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's an interesting idea. So Carl Hart is, I think, one of the head 
psychologist at Columbia University, and he was really also obsessed with, or and really interested in, in the rat experiments. And so he did his own experiment where he actually gave someone the option to do crack cocaine or take money. And he found that after, you know, long enough, if the money is high enough, people will choose to take the money over crack or cocaine or whatever drug. And, and what that kind of taught him and the kids at, Psycho- at, at Columbia was that, um, when it comes to drug use, people have a tendency to act rationally. What does that mean? Like a lot of this theory in the 60s and 70s, when you take heroin, you take crack, you do a drug, you kind of terminate this demon, and it's like all these problems come about and the drug kind of changes you mentally and you're just a zombie. Um, believe it or not, that was kind of the school of thought, even psychologically, in the 60s and 70s. And you're seeing this science now where, you know what, it, that's not actually the case people who use drugs and we've all used drugs you can actually act rationally you know when it comes to a being on drugs and choosing to use drugs so this idea that anyone who takes a drug you know is going to become immediately addicted um is crazy and i, and I think you're beginning to see science that really kind of disproves that mm-hmm. there's another great person i was researching while we we're doing this and um Harari, he wrote a book called Chasing the Scream, and he also mentions that. Like, you know, there's a reason why if you break your ankle or your leg and you go to the hospital, they give you morphine, and you're on morphine for a week while you're in the hospital, and you leave the hospital, you're not going to continue using morphine because you act rationally. You know, listen, like, I'm not going to, I don't want to continue using morphine no matter how it makes me feel because I want to continue on with my life. That wasn't always the thought process. In the past, people thought, all right, you're using morphine, they're instantly addicted, it's a problem. So, um, that's basically what that experiment kind of talked about. Hmm. And how do you how do you stop them from just using the money to go get more crack and you know type of like what's the you know the um, like how do you stop that from influencing the decision on what they do? I would say you know this is where I've kind of come full circle. I mean, for me, I guess after making these films, I've realized that people use drugs. There's no way Tiago will ever stop using drugs. You can put him whatever AA meeting, whatever rehab, he'll never stop. Um, so the only thing you can do is really manage the problem. And I think governments like Portugal are making that kind of, I guess, um, concession, this understanding that, you know what, we're not going to win the drug war, so let's manage it. So what does that mean? Mm. We're going to actually give people access to methadone. If they do get cleaner, they need, they want help, then we'll help them find a job and for lack of a better word we'll just stop treating them like shit and it was really interesting what happened they basically took you know all drug use and 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 selling drugs out of the hands of the police and put it completely in the hands of the medical system and it has its problems it's not like the ideal system and it gets a lot of criticism but what i can say which is really interesting about portugal and a lot and you can't dispute this they were able to um reduce overdose deaths by 80 percent wow. and that's like that's a scientific fact and you can talk to anyone who disagrees with legalizing or decriminalization mm-hmm. you can't dispute that fact and an interesting you know idea that comes about people ask well is it going to continue to be a thing in, in portugal is it going to continue to work do, do other governments want to do this if you ask anyone in portugal at least that i met there's no conversation about going back to the old way everyone kind of agrees this is you know, best for society. The other interesting that thing that came about when they decriminalized is everyone thought more people are going to use drugs. Um, mm-hmm. That didn't happen, actually. It's really marginal. It's like maybe within a percentage point or two, maybe statistically I saw that, but for the most part, there's no data to support that when they decrimmed, um, more people started using drug and it became this like drug-free holiday place. That didn't happen. Mm-hmm. What actually happened was stigma became a lot better what does that mean if you have a problem you can go to your doctor now and say well like i have an alcohol problem i have a drug problem can you help me you know it's tough in canada north america to do that if you have a cocaine problem it's a big deal to tell your family and go to a doctor and say listen dude i have a cocaine problem help me it's a Mm. lot easier if you're an alcoholic yeah because it's out in the open and it's socially accepted and it's much easier to say you know i'm I'm probably drinking too much because and cocaine's not all that much a social drug it is something that you will uh, kind of keep to yourself and just, you know, go down to the basement and spend days there and not, and nobody would be the wiser type of thing. For sure. And I guess that was my favorite part about places like Portugal that decrim because they help reduce stigma and they help the social aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So when people 
feel they have a problem, you can talk openly about it. You can walk into your doctor's office or um, a harm reduction clinic on the street and say, man, you got to help me. Or, you know what, I'm not ready to quit. Do you have any clean needles you can give me? And they help you and they do that. And the other thing that happened was they completely eradicated HIV, as far as I can tell. So for the most part, you know, here's what this all means. They decided not to fight the drug war. They just thought just manage it and it was a lot more successful than yeah than other places in the world like manila where i went to where jesus you could just be walking on the street and you put on a list for using drugs and you know you're shot in the head because the Duterte, this crazy maniac leader decided that that's the way he wants to solve the problem wow and what type of numbers i saw a funeral home director say that you know his business has gone through the roof i think he said something like a thousand since 2016 but then i heard another uh Figure yeah. of like thirty thousand. Is that related to murders since yeah, the yeah. new so, regime came in? So a thousand, a thousand was just in his funeral parlor. Wow. Consider, yeah, there's a, like a ton of funeral parlors like his. So there's an excellent sixty minute segment just this weekend, and it was um, talking about the drug war and the problem that journalists are having while they're telling the story. So as far as we can tell, the numbers are hard to, um, you know, find out exactly. But Rappler is one of the most important news organizations in Manila, and they're saying it's between 26 and 6,000 wow. extrajudicial killings, um, which is pretty crazy. I mean, that's already, you know, stepping in line with a genocide. Genocidal, which, yeah. Yeah, which is which is nuts. So, um, but it was nice to see that the story is still kind of being told around the world and even on 60 Minutes. Mm. What I liked about the 60 Minutes story was, you know, what happens to filmmakers and journalists who go down there and tell the story. We had an issue, too. We were filming someone who was just executed on the street and the police started filming us and it was freaking me out a little wow. bit. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's not a, not a safe place to tell that story. Mm. I really, I get that. And, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about Vincent Go. What he t- what a, he's t- just featured so well in this film. He he's the photographer, the right? Yeah. And, yeah, and he, sure. he's in Manila. He's a Filipino. Filipino photographer, yeah. photojournalist. He's and his, sitting uh, here, seeing him joking around with his father on the couch there, I love when he's busting his yeah. hump about ah ha ha. He likes Trump. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was so no, cute. It's interesting. Yeah. So it's you know, I mean, what's really interesting about Vincent is like you know he, this is the person who basically goes to these places where people are shot and he documents it and he tries to get, you know, justice by having this stuff publicized and all over the world and he's worked with publications across the world. But he's still pretty much in the minority. What's sticking out the most about being in Manila was how popular the Duterte and the drug policy is. It's widely popular. And that doesn't get talked about. Everyone just says, you know what, this Duterte guy is killing people. He's kind of this maniacal leader, but his popularity is insane. And his drug policy is insane, so um, yeah. insanely popular. So you know that's what I found super interesting. You know he's just being perpetuated, and 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 by the general public who actually think what he's doing is, is very positive. So I was surprised to see people like Vincent who are witnessing this and you see this, these drug killings in the newspaper every day. Um, the city of Manila and largely the country of the Philippines like very much supports what's going on. Cool. Uh, what do you say to the people that kind of come from the school of thought like I do, that you're always going to have poor, you're always going to have mass murderers, you're gonna, always going to have a certain population of minority, a certain population right. of the, and I love the idea of management. And you're always right. going to have your addicts. That, and and, and right. you talked about uh, Tiago. It, it sounds to me like he's happy. He's doing his little pottery and his yeah. art. He, he doesn't it doesn't sound like he's all oh, tomorrow I'm going to kick this thing tomorrow I'm getting off right. this he's like you know what leave me in a, leave me alone if I want to put yeah. something in my body that's my choice so what do you say to the people that say you know what you're yeah I mean, you can manage it but you're never going to cure the problem of addiction it's just it goes inherently with the with the idea that we we want to change well, I mean we've been chewing leaves and fermenting yeah. uh fruit and stuff to change our state since the beginning of time. So, you know, that's not going anywhere yeah. anytime soon. No, it's interesting. I actually agree with you. I have a bit of a libertarian approach to, to that. Like, I'm, for me, you know, we've been using drugs since the dawn of time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think, I, I don't know what the statistic is. I would imagine about 20% of the population uses drugs sometimes at some point in their life, mm-hmm. experimented with drugs. So for me, you know, the idea that, you know, we're going to be this kind of 
Puritan society and we shouldn't be using drugs and like the mess from like Nancy Reagan just say no. I think it's crazy because I actually feel like as human beings, um, we do stuff that's bad for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I feel like, you know, drugs are a part of life. Drinking is a part of life. Of course, you can abuse these things. (laughs) Excuse me. I mean, for the most part, the idea that you're going to eradicate substances is just crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, um, I think there needs to be more acceptance um, about the idea that we all use drugs. We smoke cannabis, occasionally do coke, people drop ecstasy, people do drugs. Mm. And It's funny how we put alcohol in a different category. We talk about alcohol and drugs. We forget that, you know, alcohol is a drug. Coffee is a drug, for crying out loud. (laughs) Yeah, no, caffeine is actually a drug. Yeah, stimulant. I mean, obviously, ones are worse for you than others. I mean, you Mm -hmm. can make the argument that alcohol is actually the worst one when you think about it. For sure it is, yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting if I go on a little rant here about the history of alcohol. (laughs) So, so in alcohol, you had the Prohibition era, and then all of a sudden... You know, alcohol becomes legal again. So that's like late 30s, early 40s. You had people like Harry Anslinger and a lot of law enforcement agents who, when prohibition ended, um, had nothing to do. So mm. really, they had to set their sights on something else. So they started going after drugs, um, marijuana and cocaine and heroin. So one of the first things that Harry Anslinger did. Who, I mean, you can make the argument that he was a fundamental person who helped start the idea of the DEA and, and the drug, like, you know, these drug police that kind of, you know, went out to fight the drug war that we know today. But he actually ended up doing some crazy racist things by going after jazz singers in New York. Yeah, and, and he was the king of propaganda. Even the word marijuana, yeah, I think, came from Ainslinger, like, didn't it? But it's fun. I'm glad you know that because he was actually a master of propaganda. Mm-hmm. And he started going after Mexicans, and he actually, I, I believe he turned the term marijuana. Yeah. Um, cocaine and heroin was a thing from, you know, that he predominantly thought a lot of black musicians were using, which is completely racist. And yeah. he had the whole Billie Holiday story and, and like, drove her to insanity and arrests. And anyway, so if you look at the evolution of alcohol and the evolution of, you know, the drug war, um, yeah, I mean, the drug war for me started in like these really crazy racist ideals, and they just and it just didn't end. And you just kind of, you know, went into the next century where people still believe all these drugs and substances, you know, unlike alcohol, are completely different. When really, you know, the chemical difference between something like Adderall and meth are like very very similar. So. Um, I just kind of feel the more I've done research and the more that I understand um, drug culture and, and drug life, to get mad at people for using substances and kind of ban it is it completely impossible. What surprised you? Did, what, I mean, we talked about a couple of things that popped up for both right. of us, you know, as I was watching, as you were creating a movie. What, what other surprises came up for you? And, and I should, uh, we should say, the idea was to go to the safest and most dangerous parts of the world to right. see the difference in how addicts, you, you know, were treated and sure. how, how they uh, dealt with policy in those countries. I guess the thing that surprised me the most was, um, like, I knew what harm reduction was, and and I learned a lot more about what that means, not just for drugs, but what this idea of living with, you know, your so-called demons or drug use or addictions and being able to manage it and really means what that means. So, like, harm reduction is this idea that you meet people where they're at. Um, and, yes, it means things like safe injection sites and <laughs> safe needle programs and and like methadone, but you realize that harm reduction plays a role in everyone's life every day. A mm-hmm. spelt, for instance, is harm reduction. You know, sure. you're driving on the highway, you want to put on a seat, you don't, you know, you hope you don't have to use it, but, you know, you know sometimes you're going to drive fast, I feel safer with it. When you're in McDonald's and you're picking a Big Mac instead of a salad, you're doing that because you see the calories that are now mandatory to be printed underneath the actual menu item. No offense to and, McDonald's, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no offense, but, I, but I actually, but I like that principle, this idea that we, for lack of a better word, choose to live with some sin. We are never going to get rid of that. So 
So let's just try to manage it. Maybe mm. I only have one Big Mac. But if I have uh, access to that information, right. if I'm allowed to know the details of what's in some of this food, what is bad, what is wrong with cigarettes, you know, how much fat is in a hamburger. I, I like that information because mm-hmm. now, you know, I know that I'm not a perfect human being. I'm going to live with all these problems, but I can manage <laughs> how much of a shit I can be in life, you know? And I, and I feel like that's what I learned. If you start to understand and do more research in harm reduction, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I think when you take that principle and you apply it to drug use, um, it really, really helps manage the problem. So isn't that the argument for legalization? Because now, nowadays, you know, I, I, I talked to a guy that's struggling with cocaine the right. other day. He's actually in my yeah. men's group, and, and it's a daily thing for him. And right. I said, bro, it's like, it's not, I, I, I hear you. I hear you talking. But it's right. not cocaine. It's meth. It's methamphetamine. Right. There is no cocaine left in today's coke in North right. America. So is that the idea of legalization? So listen, you want to get heroin, you don't have to worry about the Chinese fentanyl. You, or, yeah. or, or you want to get cocaine or whatever, you don't have to worry about the, the cheap filler drugs that they're putting in it. But nowadays, right. I mean, with cannabis, you, you know what you get. With alcohol, you pretty much know what you get. But right. now those two are legalized and the, the supply is controlled. And you think... You know, if you're going to a regulated source, uh, not only is the source safer, but if you want, if you're tired of it, you can throw your hands up and say, "Okay, I'm done." Where's the Where's the copy of the of yeah. how I get off this substance? It's really the million dollar question, and I don't know that anyone's really figured it out. It's this idea of you know how do you kind of legalize it, crim harder drugs. Um, I've just come to learn that it's. A matter of choice there's not one system that's going to work for everyone and and there's going to have to be sacrifices what does that mean like so portugal for instance made a decision like they arguably had a, a terrible opiate problem in the 90s from afghan heroin coming in and they made a decision and they didn't know what would happen if more people would use or not use if they decrim but they decided to do it for one reason only they wanted to reduce opiate deaths. And if you look at Canada and how many people in North America are dying from you know, doing fentanyl, um, there's doctors who will say it maybe makes sense to give people who use drugs that 10% access to prescription fentanyl. And the reason you would do that is so that they don't go to the street and buy the shitty stuff. And you're beginning to see this. There's a pilot program I was reading in the Globe and Mail talking about this. Uh, But a week ago, there's like a couple doctors in Vancouver who are beginning to prescribe um, fentanyl patches to hardcore users who need it. It's only eight to 10 people. But, you know, this is legitimate doctors taking this idea, um, you know, into society. And it's hard for people to wrap their head around. But it all comes down to this one idea. Do we want people to stop dying? Um, Do we accept all the other sacrifices that may come about if we decide to legalize? But at the end of the day, I make a decision to like not have people die. Let's start there and then kind of figure out a plan after we've made that decision. And I really feel like eventually in our lifetime, we're going to see some type of legalization or decriminalization with opiates and harder drugs. It's just a matter of time. We just have to figure out how to make it safe for everybody and how to make sure, you know, it's prescribed properly. It's not abused. Um, But if you think about what's happening now, it seems to me like that makes the most sense. There's a lot of people who completely disagree with me, but after doing all these drug docs and going over the world and watching what was going on, um, I kind of feel like that to me makes the most sense. Mm. Uh, Did you know that rats meditate before this movie? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> I, I, rats do a lot of interesting things. Like, they, they, they raise each other. Like rats meditate. meditate. What are you kidding? Come yeah. on. Yeah. Oh. You know, it was really interesting when I learned about rats, and, and I just kind of was amazing. I haven't told many people this, but um, there was a lot of rats who actually did heroin. Um, they actually in, in Rat Park. They actually did heroin, but they didn't get as addicted to it as it, the rats in isolation. Mm. And what I found interesting about that was that. Um, animals like rats have the propensity to use drugs recreationally. Wow. Um, I found that really interesting. And not a lot of people talk about that part of the experiment, but that's kind of what I found to be, uh, to be super interesting about that whole experiment. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's really interesting about Rat Park is even the rats that were high on heroin in within the park, 
they weren't shunned. There was no stigma. It wasn't like one rat would look at the other and like, you're hot, I'm not talking to you. Um, which is also like a little lesson we can learn, you know? It's a yeah. society where they didn't care about people who were, or other rats who were using drugs. Yeah, what is it about humans that, you know, I remember when we were back in high school, it was like a, you'd, you'd drop mushrooms. Well, you couldn't hang around with anybody that wasn't on mushrooms. You're like, no, you're not on our level. And you know what it's like when you walk into a party and you haven't had a beer and they're yeah. 10 beers in. You, it's just, you don't, you can't, you can't just, you know, mingle right in. So I don't know what it is about humans. Well, I mean, I, that's a good point in general. There's a lot of, humans are really kind of shitty to each other. <laughs> when we use drugs. There's a lot of, Judgment. You know, I was filming a documentary for W5 about fentanyl and Sault Ste. Marie two years ago, and this um, social worker had this great, I guess, metaphor example <laughs> where, and I don't know if this actually happened, it, it sounds like it may have, but there was someone who was ODing on fentanyl, and there was someone at the other end of town who, was, who had a heart attack, and there's only one ambulance, and there's a hypothetical question, who does the ambulance choose to save? Um, most people would assume the heart attack victim, but when you dive deeper into it and you realize that the fentanyl person had some really bad life circumstances, um, they did it accidentally, they didn't know they were doing fentanyl, and then you look at the person who actually had the heart attack and realize that he smoked a pack of cigarettes a day and ate two Big Macs a day. Um, like who really, <laughs> when you when it comes down to how to worse lifestyle, and, and I kind of found that to be a really interesting comparison. Mm. Tell me a little bit about your media tour with the with the movie. How's that been going for you, and what have you experienced in in that uh, realm? Because I I see well, you're on the globe, you're everywhere lately. Well, I, I guess you should yeah. be to promote the movie, and it's just it's just come out. So good on you. But what what have you what has your experience been uh, dealing with the media in Canada and elsewhere? It's been really positive. You know, there's there's a lot of haters out there. When you talk about decrim and legalization, people think you know. Listen, when when people have kind of growing up with drug war mentality and, and kind of feel mm. like all drugs are bad, then, yeah, it's, it's hard to change their opinions. You, you try to do your best. I mean, I love the the response I'm getting from the medical community and, and doctors and, and social workers and psychology students. I was asked to speak um, next week, actually, at U of T to a bunch of psychology students, which is great. Wow, um, cool. So, so, yeah, I think um, from that perspective from kind of the medical community harm reductionist doctors they really appreciate it because they they're kind of on the front lines and they understand that like evidence-based approaches to addiction are really needed um but yeah i mean i did a reddit talk the other day i was saying before we got on, oh that must have on, been on scary man yeah it was just like there's a lot of hatred it's like and, and i'm really you know, you, you, yeah you're trying to make an argument like listen this is how what i believe in terms of decriminalization mm -hmm. maybe we should begin to understand that in the future legalizing other drugs could be a good idea and it was it was a lot of like you know dickish people just kind of it, like I, I couldn't there wasn't anything i could say uh, and maybe this is me not being intelligent enough but i i had trouble in any way shape or form convincing them that you know, this may be a good idea. Um, and, I, and I kind of felt like wherever I went, whatever argument I would put forth, people really felt that, you know, drug users use drugs, they destroy their own lives, basically, they, they've made their decision, like, that's not my problem. Um, and I think that's kind of a shitty attitude, because we all live with problems, whether it's alcohol, whether it's, you know, video game addiction, driving fast, like, you know, I, I just kind of feel like to isolate one community for the substances they put on their body is kind of ridiculous. Mm, amen. I uh, agree with you there. So what you're saying is there's actually people on your AMAs, and, and Reddit's a scary place to, I don't go out on Reddit, but I heard that that's where, you know, it all starts type of thing, unless you're on 4chan. But you're, you're telling me there's actually people that are passionately against legalization of drugs because they think, what, it's going to make the problem worse? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Wow. But I mean, and that's kind of the reason I made Rat Park, because you really have to get into the history of the drug war, the history of harm reduction, understand drug policy, understand a lot of information to make a really informed decision. The history of Alcoholics Anonymous, how many people, you know, are actually problem users compared to not problem users. Like, you know, it's like anything. It's one, it's, it's an idea. It's a con, like you talk about addiction and people have their surface 
comments about it and, and their like judgments, but to really, to really understand it, you really have to dive deep and, and do a lot of research in, into all these topics. And, and, and I feel like it's not just, you know, as simple as saying, hey, that's not my problem. I don't want it in my backyard. Like, mm. forget it. But there's, there's so much to learn about it. So I would just encourage people to like, you know, research you know, what harm reduction actually means and look at the statistics and look at the data when it comes to evidence-based treatment and look at what happens in society when, like, you know, people have access to safe needles and methadone. Like, HIV goes down. Mm. It's absolutely proven. It happens all over the place. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a matter of, like, really spending the time and energy and, and doing a ton of research and understanding mm. all the, you know, political and psychological and and you know addition issues surrounded to the topic and, mm. and i feel like if people more people did that they have more compassion towards drug users and understand that this is a super complex topic um the problem is it just crosses so many lines between you know drug policy um personal use um psychology it's just all these different you know, mm. <laughs> types of science and, and, and sociology that you have to really understand to understand what's going on. What's your intention for what people come away from after seeing the film, Shani? That's a good question, actually. Um, I would say just to, at the very least, be more curious about drug policy and, and how governments um, perceive the drug war. You know, someone told me recently that, you know, the U.S., absolutely can't stand that we legalize cannabis oh, no, no, no. um and you know at the very least just do a little bit of research into harry anslinger the drug war mm. and see how the drug war started and you know understand that you know this idea that all the people that were fighting in vietnam and using heroin when they came back they weren't continuing to use heroin they actually stopped using heroin so this kind of proves carl hart's idea that you know rational people use drugs and given the choice given the environment given you know the right circumstances they won't continue to use so mm -hmm. it's 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 in a nutshell just do your research and and, and don't watch intervention in these shows and just pass judgment on on people who use drugs like go a little deeper Cool. How's the uh, movie impacted you, if all? Um, impacted me in what way? Just like yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's got to be really heart stressful to be with a guy like Tiago, who seems like just such a sweet human being. Yeah. He's a crack addict, but yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of want to go visit him because he's just so. He was actually the easiest one to be with. To be honest, because he you know why was it so hard for me to watch him get high? But that was really, yeah, I, I was really having a heart, like just watching him fire up that pipe and talk about the crack. And, and did he say that stuff was already smoked? Or he'd no, no, no. Oh, I okay. think if you kind of, because, you know, the documentary is built in a way that was truthful and you mm. kind of like him. And yeah, like, yeah. Like, and it's like, dude, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, you know, the point is, he's fine. It's just like he's been doing it for 20 years. You're not going to change him. Um, so just accept the fact that he wants to do it. He wants to be left alone. You know, he's mm -hmm. probably going to live a long life and, and continue to use drugs. So whatever, leave him alone. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, that's what I liked most about Tiago. It's like, you know, I, I just kind of felt like he was the one person that, um, authentic. Was, yeah, it was so totally authentic. Like I asked him, like, are you cool with me using drugs? And he's like, yeah, you know, absolutely. It's my God-given right. I want to show the world that I'm not doing a crime. And, and I respected that conviction. You know, why? Like, who am I to judge him for doing drugs? Well, I think like, it's the whole know. libertarian belief that, you know, it's my yeah. body and I'll put what I want into it. And if I want to stop my own heart, I can stop my own heart. You know, they can stay out of my yeah. life government type of thing. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And it's like, you know, he's not hurting anyone. He's doing drugs in the privacy of his own home. Who are we to say not to do that? Like, it's like having, and he's actually got it down to a science, so he knows exactly how much to do, and, and he's moderated, you know, the pharmacological input into how much he's doing to a point that is, you know, within milligrams, so he's not ODing anytime soon, he's, he understands, so for, for me, it's like, I'm not going to go into his life and dictate after him using drugs for all these years and 
being a successful artist that dude hey stop using drugs you shouldn't be like who am i to say that mm -hmm. you know it's it's worked for him and and that's kind of the point of portugal it's like portugal allowed him to do that allowed him to be that person and crime has went up more people aren't using in portugal all they've been able to do is reduce opiate um overdoses by close to 80 percent which for me would seem like a pretty positive thing yeah, we always hear about Amsterdam as far as legalization of drugs, and I was surprised yeah. to hear that Portugal was that progressive as well. I wonder why we don't, why they're not a leading example of you know where it's actually made a difference. You know, the legalization. I think I think the one knock I would have on Portugal is it really made this great move by decrimming drugs um, seventeen or eighteen years ago, but they haven't really taken it to the next step. Um, it's still technically illegal to buy drugs there. Um, there's a lot of problems with um, stigma in certain neighborhoods. Um, but at the end of the day, what they were able to do is make it more of a medical problem. I just wish Portugal um, thought more about actually legalizing and taking it taking the experiment like one step further. Um, it seems like they were content with where they were at and they you know, there's other countries now in terms of harm reduction that are surpassing them in terms of, um, you know, medical care and, and, and harm reduction techniques. But I think Portugal for me was just kind of this iconic first country who tried it. I just feel like, you know, they kind of stopped. I think they could have, they had an opportunity to kind of take it a step further, but they didn't. Shawnee Cohen is my guest. He's the director of Rat Park. What's next for you, Shawnee? And is, you mentioned something just before we started rolling, before we started recording here, that you thought maybe that this might be the end of the road as far as you doing a movie on drugs or addictions or... Yeah, I kind of feel like... You know, I haven't told many people this, but I kind of feel that um, I've done four or five drug drugs about addiction, drug drugs about addiction, sorry. And I, and I kind of feel like I may you know, at least at this point in my career, take on some new material. I've done other docs from Vice that, you know, have been like anything from like PK Subban to mm. like deathmatch wrestling. And, and I, I'm, I think I'm pretty, um, I've, I've become a much better filmmaker all around. And I kind of feel like my larger, bigger projects tend to do with drugs. And I kind of feel like Rat Park for me was the big statement I kind of wanted to make. I want people to learn more about drug policy and the war on drugs and understand that history. Um, at this point, yeah, I don't know if I want to make another drug documentary. I kind of feel like I want to, you know, maybe try another topic or, or do something a bit different. Um, yeah, just, that may change, but that's just how I feel now. It was also a really taxing documentary to make. Like, we were literally in areas where I'm like standing over dead bodies, people using drugs. Wow. It was like, it was, it was like, it was a very, you know, taxing documentary. I wouldn't okay. say it was, it was like an overly complicated one to make in terms of, um, you know, being in super dangerous places, but it was just, it was just tough to be around death a lot. And I kind of feel like the next step for me is to maybe do something. <laughs> well, amen, brother. I can hear you there. So uh, talk to us about some of the people that helped bring this movie to fruition, the people that had your back and other contributors to the yeah. project. I mean, for me, the, the one person who was instrumental in getting this done was Rachel Brown. Um, she used to work at Vice. She works for Global now, but she um, was the producer. This is actually her first feature um, project that she's produced. She's produced other smaller things with me, including the W5 piece, but... Um, she is like a renowned and incredible journalist when it comes to to uh, drug use. So I think for me, her ethical approach to you know understanding the details about drug use were were kind of paramount to me getting this done. And, and yeah, she was just a soldier with me through this. Um, great cinematographer. Um, so Chris Wardell was just this kid who could probably the best drone operator in the country and I needed that because I really wanted to compare Rat Park from high angles similar to how you see it in the experiment so throughout every scene you kind of see these high angles yeah and it, that was that was kind of done on purpose to kind of make you feel um like you know you were like a rat in a cage per se well Manila, Manila, Manila looks Manila. like an, yeah Manila yeah, looks like an yeah. absolute war zone when you're taking those pictures from the ground and then yeah. the ones from the from the um from the drone that were really high up. It, it, I don't, well, were we looking at a graveyard? What were all those, it looks like yeah, a yeah, container was, shipyard was, or something. That place was screwed up. That was uh, Manila <laughs> North Cemetery. So that, that place is, what was interesting about Manila, like that, 
that's a whole like neighborhood. People actually live on the tombstones and a lot of them are paid to take care of other tombstones, but there's a whole community living in the graveyard. Um, and there's actually quite a big drug problem in the graveyard. So we, there's one story that didn't make the film. Um, we found this woman and her son and her husband was caught using drugs near the border and police came up and just shot him in the head. Um, and it was this tragic story and, you know, <laughs> he's super poor. What a lot of people don't realize about people using drugs in the Philippines, they don't just use meth to, um, for recreation. Like a lot of them, like you have to understand these areas are super poor and people need to stay up all night and work. So if you're driving a rickshaw or you're selling stuff on the street or you're just hustling in the, uh, in the fish market, you want to stay up late and work and provide for your family. And it's hard to do that 20 hours a day. So a lot of them will take a bit of mess or what's called shabu just to stay awake. Um, and they'll get killed for doing that. So like the, uh, and what's really interesting too, is a lot of the places we were at, um, um, were garbage kind of processing places where people live. And this is a lot of Canadian garbage that they're processing. So, oh, yeah, we all heard about the, yeah. I yeah, forgot it. It so was the like, Philippines that had our containers yeah, over there and they're like sending it. them back. <laughs> so it's this insane situation where you have like Canadian garbage there and processed by people trying to stay up to do it by, you know, using meth to just, you know, <laughs> essentially stay up a little longer to make a couple bucks and they're getting executed for doing it. Um, so the irony and, and the hypocrisy was just nuts. Hmm. Well, I really appreciate your time, Shani. Uh, but I don't know if we got into uh, what do you got coming up next? What do you think? You're, what are you leaning towards? Or can you t even talk about that? Um, I got nothing on the horizon. Actually. Okay. I'm, I'm exploring a couple ideas just through Vice. I'm going to be doing um, some more digital work with Vice, meaning like kind of short films. Um, working on the short thing right now. Which is okay. So, yeah. So I think, um, which is not really about addiction. It's just more looking at, um, you know, kind of the fun side of cannabis. So from that point, <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of long stuff, I, I, I don't have anything planned. Something will come to me though. And what's everyone's problem with vice? What yeah, good question. <laughs> like taking um, so much heat I, for being employed I by like vice for. I mean, it gets, it gets a bad rap, but I, for the most part, you know, there's just, there's a lot of brilliant people there. I just feel like, um, listen, the company is like over 2000 people now. And, and I uh -huh. feel like, it's kind of a teenager kind of coming into, you know, past adolescence. And, and it's such a young media company. It's going to go through these problems and there's going to be scandals, but they're on the right track. And I think, you know, I have no doubt in my mind that they're going to be like a media powerhouse in the next 10 years. But really? people forget sometimes they haven't been like, it's not seeing them. They haven't been around for 20, 30, 40 years. Is this the same so, vice that I hear Tim Poole and Gavin McInnes talking about all the time? Okay, yeah, Tim Poole was there in the early days, and I think uh, Gavin yeah. McInnes was a co-founder at, at one point and sold it. Yeah, uh, years ago. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, and I really, uh, I really appreciate your work. I'm proud of you, brother. This, uh, it's, uh, I don't, I don't know you at all, but uh, just looking at your art and your your contribution to society, I think it's valuable, and uh, I'm hoping that somebody's going to get something out of it. I, mean, I, I was kind of had some reservations about going into it because, you know, I want to, I'm constantly trying to, um, police what my eyes see. You know, I right. don't, I don't watch network news because I don't want to, I don't want the story of the, you know, the mother killing her newborn baby to creep up on me right. and then it's too late. You can't go back. So, you know, I get my news from YouTube and I click on where I want or right. whoever the internet or what have you. So uh, I had some reservations about going in, but then, the characters that you featured really made me feel connected. Right. For lack of a better term. Yeah, I no, and I appreciate that. I mean, I think what you're feeling in general, even though, um, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up YouTube because I work in a lot of different mediums, but there's nothing like feature documentaries. Like you can watch CNN and you can learn about, you know, the impeachment trials in five minutes, whatever you want. Sure. But for me, when you have the opportunity to tell a story over two hours, you're really diving deep into the social issues, you're understanding characters, and you're bringing out um, information that you're just not going to get on a quick YouTube hit. So I just, I love the fact that you're promoting documentary, long form documentary. I love that it's so accessible on Netflix and Amazon and Crave right now because, you know, I think if you really want to understand a subject, you know, I was watching The Great Hack the other day and it was 
on Netflix, great film, and it's all about YouTube Analytica and what happened with the Trump campaign. And you watch that film, you will understand everything that happened with the Trump campaign. Well, so and, a, a and then to follow it up with Get Me Roger Stone and you'll figure out exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, for sure. But I mean, you're not going to learn just watch it, uh, like uh, truly about these topics unless you watch like these long form documentaries and really involve yourself in that topic. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, that, and that's why, and that's for me why I love documentary because, you know, sometimes it takes an hour and a half to explain a subject. And, right. And I feel like, you know, I was just listening to like a Malcolm Gladwell uh, podcast and, and it was fascinating because, you know, it was 42 minutes long for a podcast, but like this one, it's an hour. You're not going to get all the information you need unless you, basically flush the whole issue and understand from A to B what's going on. And again, you just can't do that in short news it. So long form for me is everything. I appreciate your time. Shawnee Cohen is my guest. He's the director of Rat Park. It's available on Crave now. You can watch it. I was surprised to see it there today. Um, your uh, PR director did give me a, a, a link to watch it online. But then I, I'm like, well, I started watching it on my phone. I'm like, hang on. I'm going to Crave to find this thing. And then there it was. Yeah. So uh, I'm yeah. proud of your brother. It uh, looks like it went well. And uh, maybe when I'm in Toronto, we'll get to meet up one day. and uh, Or maybe on a, a future project, we'll get to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It was fun. Yeah, Shani, just in the way out, uh, any uh, contact information or anything you want to get out or say to the listeners or uh, viewers out there? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in a little bit more about the topic, if you go to vice.com, okay. Canada, and then you'll see a little header at the top, and it's called Rat Park. Okay. And if you click, if you just click on that, um, you can watch the trailer. There's a behind the scenes. There's great articles about legalization. So all this information we talked about is available on that microsite. Great. I appreciate your time. Thank you, brother. Let's, uh, we'll touch you up soon. Good. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye. Cheers. Shawnee Cohen, if you need him. He is the director of Rat Park, and uh, I was uh, really enjoyed it. It was <laughs> great. He went to uh, the most dangerous parts of the world uh, to look at uh, how drug addiction and um, prohibition and treatment and everything was different, and I was surprised to find out that... Uh, Portugal is actually a place of the world that's been legal. Uh, All the drugs, mostly, almost all drugs, I think, have been legal for almost 20 years now. Uh, You know, we hear about all, um, Amsterdam seems to be, you know, an example of uh, a country that's gone and um, legalized drugs and and not seen the the spike in use. Uh, So, Shawnee Cohen, that was uh, cool. And uh, thank you, (coughs) excuse me, Ingrid Hamilton. You're my contact there. I appreciate you lining up that that interview. So uh, I think that's it for now. We're going to sign off for now. And you can find this with better audio later on the YouTube channel. Uh, like, share, uh, comment, and peace out.